stuff, re-explain some of this. You might find especially helpful for some of the homeworks for today and tomorrow, then you will always be able to do so. All right. So like I was saying earlier, like Brandy was asking earlier, we are in week six of the last term of the school year here at the Excel Center. So that means that we have the rest of this week, week seven, and then the shortened three day long week eight, and we will be done with school for the summer. So week eight, when we get there, is essentially gonna be kind of a review week. We're gonna be talking about the things that we've learned so far and going over a lot of the information to kind of get you guys ready for the biology B final. And so week six and week seven are gonna be kind of the last weeks that we're talking about stuff. And like I said, the goal in these weeks is to zoom out a little bit, get a little bit of a bigger picture view of how organisms develop over time, how all of those genes and DNA and chromosomes that have been passed down from parent to children for dozens or hundreds or even thousands of generations can slowly change and slowly cause those plants and animals to turn into a little bit different forms or look a little bit different or develop into different species than what was there before. All right, so this process of slowly changing after hundreds or thousands of generations has a name that you may have heard of before, and it is called evolution. So evolution is all about how animals and plants on Earth have changed in the millions of years that they've been around. So the plants and animals that were living around on Earth tens or hundreds of millions of years ago do not look like the ones that we have on Earth today. And the reason for that is evolution, or this idea that slowly, over thousands and millions of generations, the genes and the chromosomes that get passed down between the generations change a little bit. And these organisms develop new traits that help them survive in their environment. And the ones with the best traits end up surviving, and the ones that don't develop the best traits end up dying out and going extinct. So evolution is this big idea about modern organisms. So the stuff, the plants and the animals that you see living around us in the world today are descended from ancient organisms. So they didn't just appear out of nowhere one day. We have this gradual change over time. And we call it the theory of evolution because in science, a theory is an extremely well-supported explanation of things that have occurred in the natural world. So a theory isn't just like a guess or uh, a couple people have found some evidence that supports it. In science, a theory means that lots of people have found lots of evidence that supports this general idea. This idea that ancient organisms have changed over time and turned into the organisms that we see living on Earth today. So that is called evolution. And again, it's all about this very slow very gradual change happening over thousands or even millions of generations. So the first guy who really developed and published the idea of evolution was named Charles Darwin. You may have heard of him before as well, usually just referred to as Darwin. He did a lot of work on this boat called the HMS Beagle 
it was sent out from England to go map the coastline of like Central and South America. And so while he was on this boat, he was in charge of like describing all of the different animals and plants that he was seeing that were different from the ones that they found in England and in Europe. And while he was going through and identifying and classifying all of these plants and animals, he started to develop this idea that these guys, even though they're on the other side of the world, they look very similar to the plants and animals that we have at home. And some of them have these really striking traits that are new to this area. So maybe something has caused these plants and animals that live over here to look a little bit different than their cousins and ancestors that live back in Europe and England. So there were, there are a couple different kind of major lines that Darwin and future scientists have looked at in order to provide evidence, to provide explanations for how evolution has worked or things that we can see today that tell us that evolution is the reason why we have all these different animals and plants on earth. So it's this evidence of common ancestry or this idea that species that today look very, very different from one another are all related to a common ancestor from millions and millions of years ago. All right, so all of the like birds, all of the mammals, all the reptiles, all the amphibians on earth today sometime way 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 in the distant past like maybe even before the dinosaur era hundreds of millions of years ago there was a common ancestor that then these different groups of organisms kind of branched out from and developed into their own species so today we're going to look at what is some of this evidence that scientists have found that can help to explain this evolution, this common ancestry from millions of years ago. One of the biggest sources of evidence that scientists use to compare ancient organisms with organisms today are fossils and fossil evidence. So the most common types of fossils you're probably familiar with are like bones, right? You go to the museum and there's a the big dinosaur skeleton. And so a fossil is essentially matter that was living, that was organic at some point, like the bones inside of a dinosaur, that over time, due to natural phenomenon and natural elements that they interacted with, turned into kind of like a stone-like substance. So we can not only get bones as a fossil, Scientists have also found fossilized eggs. They found fossilized footprints. Um, some very common fossils that you can find are the outlines of like shells and other sea organisms in certain areas of the world. Um, even in Texas in a bunch of different places and old riverbeds and stuff like that, you can find rocks that have these little imprints of shells on them. And those are ancient imprints from shells from millions or tens of millions of years ago. So because they belonged to animals from and plants from long, long, long ago, we can use fossils to kind of compare how plants and animals have changed over the past couple hundred million years. So for example, you might find a super ancient fossil of something like this guy. This is called a trilobite and they're fossils from hundreds of millions of years ago that were some of the first like sea creatures that lived on earth. And then in general, as you get closer to the surface, you find more and more recent fossils. So like what this picture down here is showing is that up on the top layer is sort of like the youngest or the most recent layer of rocks, right? 
So even rocks have layers to them. And the further down to the rock, the further down into the ground you go, the older and older you get in terms of your rock layers. So the fossils that you find in a super deep, super low down rock layer are almost always going to be much older than the fossils that you might find in the middle layer or in a little bit higher up layer. So that's kind of an important thing to remember about fossils is that the lower down in the rock they are, the older that they tend to be. So when scientists were kind of first discovering fossils and first putting them together and figuring out what sorts of animals and plants they're dealing with, they noticed two kind of general, they had two general observations that are kind of the opposite of each other. Number one is that things existed in the past that no longer exist today, right? From dinosaurs to woolly mammoths to those trilobites that I was showing you earlier, all of those things existed on planet Earth at some time, maybe millions of years ago, maybe thousands of years ago, but they no longer exist today. Those exact animals are extinct, meaning that we can't find them on Earth anymore, right? Unfortunately for us, and there are no more dinosaurs that are living on Earth. All the dinosaurs got wiped out a couple dozen million years ago. The other thing that they noticed is that there are animals and plants that exist today that did not exist in the past, right? You're not gonna find an exact, I don't know, lion skeleton from millions of years ago. You're not gonna be able to find like the imprint of a rose bush in the fossil record from millions of years ago. So we have organisms that are living today that sure you might be able to find fossils that are a couple hundred years old of them or maybe even a thousand years old. But the further you get into the past, the less and less those organisms look like the ones that we have today. So there are things that exist today that did not exist in the plant. Yes, actually, there sure are plant fossils. So like these guys right here, usually it's not the actual plant material itself that's fossilized, but the plant got like embedded or kind of smushed into a rock somehow. And then as the plant withered away and got decomposed, its imprint still exists in the rock. So especially things like big ferns and big fern leaves from the like dinosaurs time from a few dozen million years ago, there's not an actual fossilized piece of plant, but there is a fossilized imprint of a plant, kind of like similar to the footprint. So scientists have found footprints of dinosaurs and other organisms that became fossilized. And a similar thing can happen to plants where they like, I don't know, maybe fall over and fall into the ground and some of their leaves get pushed into the mud and then that mud hardens and turns into rock over time, but it keeps that imprint of the leaves. So we do know a little bit about what some of the plants that existed tens of millions or hundreds of millions of years ago looked like. Great question. So the things in the ancient past no longer exist today. And hey, Samyang, good to see you. And the things that exist today did not exist in the past. They are different. They're not the same. The scientists noticed this and were wondering, well, why is it that we can't find these different, these exact species from millions of years ago? Why do all of the old species look a little bit like the current ones, but aren't exactly the same. 
The reason has to do with evolution, that gradual change from one species into another over time. A couple of other things that scientists noticed about fossils when they really started to investigate them is that A, by doing specialized um, analysis of the rocks in the Earth's crust, so the first couple miles of the Earth, they've been able to determine that the Earth is many, many, many millions of years old. Actually, the current best estimates put it somewhere around 4 billion years old. Another thing that they noticed specifically about the fossils is that the lower down in the rock you go, the older and older that you get, you find fossils that are more primitive than those in the upper layer. Meaning that in the super, super old fossils that have some of the earliest life forms that we have so far discovered on planet Earth, they tend to be extremely simple kind of body shapes and body plans, don't really have a bunch of adaptations or a bunch of different unique characteristics. But as you get more and more recent, as you go higher up into the fossil layer and you get more and more recent fossils, you get more and more complex organisms, more organisms that have different characteristics, more structurally kind of advanced and developed types of characteristics that are a lot more than these more primitive guys down here on the bottom. So we start off super simple and basic, and then we slowly seem to add on in complexity the more recent that we get. The other thing that they noticed is that while they're not the exact same as the animals that live on Earth today, extinct fossils resemble modern animals. So they noticed that the dinosaur fossils look were structured in a similar way to things like lizards and birds that live on Earth today. Those trilobites that they found, those super simplified kind of plant or ocean organisms look similar to a lot of the crustaceans that we have in the ocean today. The woolly mammoths look very, very similar to our modern day elephants. So even though those animals are extinct, they no longer exist on Earth, they still look very similar to the animals that we do have on Earth right now. So to scientists, this suggested some sort of common ancestry or the idea that maybe the animals that are on Earth right now uh, look the same as their ancient counterparts because they descended from those organisms. Those organisms slowly changed over time and turned into the organisms we have today. Right? It's not like the dinosaurs all completely died out and then all of a sudden all these new species of lizards and birds popped up. Right, It's not like the woolly mammoths from the Ice Age all died out and then all of a sudden we had a bunch of brand new elephants appear on Earth. Instead, they started to think that maybe they changed into those organisms. So maybe the dinosaurs that did survive the great extinction event of the meteorite, maybe they changed into the birds and lizards that we see today. Maybe the large mammals and woolly mammoths and stuff that were around during the ice age, maybe those developed into the rhinos and elephants and large mammals that we see today. So again, it's all about this common ancestry, this idea that the animals and plants that are on Earth today 
are related to these ancient organisms, to these animals and plants from millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of years ago. All right, so I know I've just thrown a whole bunch of information about fossils and ancestors and evolution at you guys. Um, but does anybody have any questions, anything about fossils or this idea of evolution that you have questions on or that you wanna ask a little more about? Mr. Michael, just like the this one, the, the last one, this show a common ancestry. Ancestry. What does ancestry mean? Like, so ancestry, ancestry means that there were kind of like how your grandparents and great grandparents and great great grandparents, those are your ancestors, right? Those are the people that your modern family, your parents and you and any of your kids or nieces or nephews, that's where they came from, right? They're descended from those great, great, great grandparents way back in the 1800s, 1700s, whenever it might be. So the ancestors are the people or the animals or the plants that came before the modern ones their way in the past, and then the modern animals and plants are what are alive today. So this idea of common ancestry is saying that maybe lions and tigers and bears didn't all just start living on earth one day a thousand years ago, but maybe they all had ancestors from millions of years ago that looked kind of like them and had some of the same traits, but instead over the generations, over the thousands of millions of generations between now and then, the ancestor species, the ancient species, have turned into the modern species, the modern plants and animals that we see today. Okay, thank you, Mr. Michael. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So that's what we mean by common ancestry is that is things like all birds, almost all birds that we have today, probably descended from an ancestor that had feathers and could fly, right? All mammals today are descended from an ancestor that had hair on its body and produced milk and gave birth to live young. All of the fish that exist today co come from a common ancestor that had scales and fins and swam in the water and used gills to breathe, to get the oxygen that it needed from the water. So the ancestor is like the ancient version of our modern day species. And common ancestry means that different species that are alive on Earth today may all be related to one species that was around millions of years ago. All right, great question, Nasima. Anybody else have any questions about fossils or ancestry or some of the ideas of evolution that we've been talking about so far? All right, sounds like everyone is doing okay with some of these ideas up to now. So this is kind of one of the more basic pieces of evidence, one of the more simple ideas of behind evolution and this change over time. One of the other nice things about fossils 
is that some of them show syringition. So we have some modern organisms and some ancient organisms that look a little bit similar, but still not really that close. And so some fossils are actually great ways of seeing how one species with one set of characteristics evolved and went through different types, different iterations to become the modern species that we see today. This doesn't always happen. It all depends on what fossils we can actually find out there. So even though a species may have been around millions of years ago, at least one of its species has to become fossilized and that fossil has to be found by humans in order for us to know about it. So there are lots of areas where the fossil record is incomplete, not because there wasn't an organism that existed at that point in time, but just because we haven't found the fossil for one yet. And then again, kind of like what I was saying earlier, how old that a fossil is, is usually determined by where that fossil is found in the layers of rock where it was dug out of. So you can see in this big cliff right here, even just based on the coloration, there are lots of different layers in this rock, right? We have some thick layers like this one and this orange one here and this white one and these red ones right here, and some thinner layers. So like this guy right here, this kind of red and brown one, and then same thing right here, we have this kind of brownish grayish stuff in between. And so the further down you go in the rock, the further deeper that you get, the older that that rock layer is. So the way that these rock layers develop is they're very, very thin layers of rock and sand and mud and stuff like that that get stacked on each other over time. So all of the oldest stuff is down at the bottom. And then that, as time goes on, that gets stacked on top of and on top of and on top of with each new era, each new succession of the rock. And so based on where that a fossil was found in these rock layers, scientists can determine or at least make a observation and a hypothesis about how old the species is and which fossils are older than other fossils. So if they're dug out of the same area, the deeper fossils will always be older than the more closer to the surface fossils than the shallower fossils. And so this way we're able to get an idea of, okay, what did the oldest, some of the oldest organisms that lived on earth, what did they look like? What were their characteristics? And then what did they turn into? What was next in terms of evolution? What were some of the second oldest types of organisms? And then what was after that? What was from just a few hundred million years ago, the age of the dinosaurs? What sorts of fossils and animals do we find in there? And then finally, what are some of the most recent fossils from maybe just a couple hundred thousand or a couple million years ago? What do those fossils look like and how do they compare to the older fossils and how do they compare to the animals and plants that are still living today? So that is how scientists use the idea of fossils and the what's called the fossil record or all the fossils we found so far to kind of determine how plants and animals have changed over time, how they have evolved. They've also used something called comparative anatomy in order to look at not just fossils, but also modern day organisms, organisms, plants and animals that are alive on Earth today and figure out how can we group some of these guys into larger groups or what are some sort of basic building blocks, what are some basic pieces of the body or of the structure of the plant that are similar across lots of different organisms. 
And so we call that comparative anatomy, meaning that we're comparing how the anatomy or how the body shape of an organism is different or is similar. And so looking at the bodies of different organisms actually provides us with evidence of evolution. It actually is a way that we can show that all of these organisms that look very different from each other actually have structures in their body that are really, really close and very, very similar to each other. So we call those structures homologous structures. So you may remember when we were talking about the genetics last week, I mentioned homozygous means that they have two of the same letter, like two big or two little letters. And here's that homo prefix again, meaning the same. Homologous structures are ones where the structure itself is similar. So you see this a lot when we're comparing like bones and muscles between organisms. So the structure is similar. It's built in a very, very same way, but the animals don't use it the exact same way. So we'll look at the example of like an arm in a little bit. Some animals use their arms for digging. Some use it for swimming. Some use it for jumping. But regardless, all of the arms in these animals have a very, very similar structure. They're all made out of the same sort of organization of bones. So these homologous structures are evidence of a common ancestor. And what they tell us is that even though all these animals may be very different from each other today, at some point in the past, they all came from the same common ancestor who had this one specific type of trait, who had this one type of arm. And, that the, and then that one type of arm over time evolved into lots of different types of arm, but they're all still built the same way. They're all still structured the same way. So comparative anatomy is kind of just hard to explain in words, but it works really well if you look at some pictures. So probably the most famous example of homology or homologous structures are the arms, the limbs of mammals and even vertebrates in general, so even things like birds and lizards. So over here, we'll look at our human arm first, since that's the one most people are familiar with. Where our arm is mostly used, where it's really good for grasping and moving things, right? We have our fingers, which can grab onto stuff, and then our arm can move our hand in all sorts of different directions. Our arm is built in this one particular way. What I like to describe as one bone, two bones, and lots of little bones. So we have one bone in our forearm up here by our shoulder and elbow. There's one bone in this part of your arm. There's two bones in this part of your arm right here between your elbow and wrist. And then there's lots of little bones that make up your wrist and your hand and your fingers, right? One bone, two bones, lots of little bones. So that is how our arm is structured. So let's look at some other organisms' arms and see if they're structured the same way. Uh, here we have a shrew arm. A shrew is like a type of rodent, kind of similar to a mouse or a rat or something like that. They also have little claws that are good for like grabbing food and holding on to food and like digging through dirt and stuff like that. And if we look, it uh, looks like a shrew arm also has one bone up here at the top 
two bones in the middle, and then lots of little bones down here at the bottom. So that is pretty similar, pretty close to how a human arm is set up. So, okay, but those are very similar to each other, right? We use them for kind of the same thing. What about animals that are very good at running? Like dogs and cats, for example, or hooved animals like sheep and horses. They're pretty good at running. And let's see, here's our dog arm. And we have uh, one bone at the top and two bones in the middle and lots of little bones down here at the bottom. Just like our human arm and shrew arm. Oh, that's kind of neat. That's kind of weird. Uh, with sheep, though, they have hooves. That's completely different from human arms and fingers, right? All these guys have fingers, but sheep and horses have hooves. So let's look at sheep and horse bones. Uh, we've got one bone, uh, two bones, and then some little bones. These ones are a little bit different because for strength, they're, all their little bones down at the bottom have gotten fused into like one strong bone. But it's still the same setup. One bone, two bones, a couple little bones. What about things that swim like dolphins and seals? Well, on the surface, it might look like they just have like flippers, right? Like if you think about like a dolphin or a whale, they've got the flippers on the side that they use to kind of guide themselves through the water. But if you took a look at their x-ray and at the bones that make up the underneath part of the flipper, let's see, they got uh, one bone, two bones, lots of little bones. One bone, two bones, lots of little bones. Even if we look at something like bats or an organism that's not even a mammal, like a bird, they both use their bones and their wings for flying. Birds have feathers and bats have that kind of thin skin, but their bones are very similar. One bone, two bones, and then some little finger type bones. So even though all of these arms and legs are used for different purposes, whether you're flying or swimming or running or grasping and holding and digging, they all have the same structure. They are all built on the general blueprint of one bone, two bones, lots of little bones. So to scientists who study evolution, this suggests that at some point, a long, 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 long time ago, probably hundreds of millions of years ago, there was some type of primitive animal that had a very simple arm that had one bone two connected to two bones connected to some little finger type bones. So this is what we mean when we say that this homology or these homologous structures provide evidence of evolution. Because even though these are all very different animals, they all have the same setup in terms of the bones in their arms and legs. And the simplest explanation for this, the simplest way to explain how this could be is that they had a common ancestor long, long, long ago that had this basic setup, one, two, lots of little bones. And then that just evolved and slowly changed over time. So we just kind of modified those bones a little bit in order to be thick and close together to make a good fin for slipping or thin and spread apart so that they could be used for flying or fused and really sturdy so that we could have some hooves that were good for running and supporting on the ground. So all of these organisms most likely came from a common ancestor that had this basic arm structure. And we think that because they all share this type of structure right here. So that's why homologous structures are good evidence of common ancestor, of evolution. They are different in function, so they are used for different things, 
but they all are made out of the same general blueprint, right? The same kind of general guidelines. Again, for different animals, for different ways of getting around or for dealing with their environment, but they all have the same basic structure, whether you used for holding things or walking and running or swimming or flying, they all have one bone, two bones, lots of little bones, lots of little finger bones. So this all suggests that at some point, long, 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 long time ago, hundreds of millions well before the dinosaurs, humans and cats and whales and bats all had a one single common ancestor, one single organism that had a one bone, two bone, lots of bone structure in its arm and its primitive simple arm. And then over millions of years, we developed into flying mammals and swimming mammals and running and pouncing mammals and upright grasping mammals. But we all still have this same basic bone structure. So again, we have some sort of super primitive basic early version of our arm. And then that develops into more modified, more specialized versions of those structures. But it's all got the same one bone, two bones, little bones design, little bones structure. So those are homologous structure, things that are built in the same way, but that animals use for different things. So those are good evidence that certain organisms are related at some point in the past. On the flip side of that, we can also have what are called analogous structures. So analogous structures are structures that are used by different organisms for the same purpose. So they're used for the same thing, but they're not built the same way. They're built in completely different ways, and it's just so happened that they're used in the same way by different organisms. So analogous structures do not show common ancestry. They do not show that two organisms are related. So like flies and bats, right? They can both fly. That's kind of a major part of their life story. They're able to fly. Bats have those wings that we were just looking at earlier, where they have the bones that are connected, one bone, two bones, little finger bones. Fly wings are not built out of bones, right? Insects do not have bones. That's one of their major characteristics. Their wings are made out of this very thin membrane type of structure. And the wing is huge and it's connected to the body by a tiny little muscle right up here. But there's no bones, there's no, there's some like arteries and veins that run through them, but there's no sort of connecting or supportive structures and the wings of insects like cicadas and flies and stuff like that. So even though this is a wing and this is a wing and they both use it for flying, the wings themselves are not at all built in the same way. If you took an X-ray of this wing and an X-ray of this wing, they would look completely different. And that's because bats and flies are very, very much not related, right? Bats are related to other vertebrates like mammals and lizards and birds, and flies are invertebrates. They're in with the insects and they're similar to like crustaceans and mollusks and stuff like that. So they're both animals. They can both fly, 
but the way that they fly is completely different. And because their way they fly, because the structure of their wings is completely different, they do not have a any sort of recent common ancestor. They are very, very far apart on our kind of evolutionary tree. So same general idea with birds and insects, like this uh, damselfly right here. Birds also have a one bone, two bone, little finger bone structure in their wings. You may have seen it before if you've ever eaten chicken wings. Those are made out of the wings of a bird, AKA a chicken. And you know, some of them you get like the drumstick one that has the one big bone in it. And some of them are the kind of more round oval ones that have the two little bones in it. Those are the bones of their wing that we've been talking about. Insects, again, do not have any bones at all. Their wings are made out of these membranes and they're connected at the body right here. So even though they can both fly, they evolved how they fly completely differently. Birds developed these wings and these feathers and these bones that allowed them to fly. Insects developed these membrane wings and these small light bodies that help them to fly. So even though being able to fly is a pretty big characteristic and both of these guys can fly, that does not mean that they are related because the way that they fly, the structures that they use to fly are completely different from one another. They're not close, they're not similar. And so we don't think that they have a very common ancestor. Same general idea behind, you may have noticed that a lot of organisms that live in the water, especially vertebrates like seals and penguins, have very similar body shapes, right? They both have these kind of long tube shaped bodies. And again, that's not because seals and penguins are super closely related, right? Seals are a mammal and penguins are a bird. So they are both vertebrates, they do both have bones, but that's not the reason why their bodies are shaped so similarly. The reason is because animals that live in the water and have to deal with like water resistance when they're swimming around, tend to evolve these big streamlined bodies that make it easier for swimming. So even though these are both streamlined swimming organisms, they don't necessarily come from the exact same tree, right? This guy is more closely related to a rat or to an elephant than he is to a penguin. So just because organisms share some characteristics, it doesn't mean that they are very closely related. It might just mean that they both come up with similar evolutionary traits in order for the characteristic that they want. Both these guys wanted to swim in the water better. So over time, they evolved these more tube-like and streamlined bodies. So homologous structures and homology mean structures that are built very similar to each other. And they are evidence that at some point, the organisms with those structures were likely related or likely had a similar ancestor. Whereas analogous structures and analogy says that even if animals look kind of like each other or use structures in the same way, if those characteristics are not built the same if they do not come from the same place or from the same shape, then they are probably not very closely related. It doesn't mean that they have to be related to one another just because these two guys are able to fly doesn't mean that they are very closely related. 
It just means that they have happened to each develop the ability to fly differently from each other. All right, so homology, homologous structures, analogous structures are ways of either suggesting that animals are related and have evolved from one another or are not related and have evolved independently. Anybody have any more questions about evolution or what these different types of structures means? I know it's a whole lot that I'm throwing at you guys today, um, but these are really, really important ideas that can help kind of explain how we have ended up with the plants and animals on Earth that we did. So is there anything about these structures or about evolution and evidence for evolution that you have questions on, you're still a little bit confused about, you're still not really sure about, anything like that. No. Righty. So one last thing that I wanted to bring up and regarding this kind of a comparative anatomy or looking at the different parts of the body on different organisms is sometimes organisms have a part of their body that on first glance doesn't really look like it belongs there, doesn't really look like it should have them, right? Ostriches live their entire lives on the ground and run along the ground using their big long legs, uh, but they still have wings as if they could fly. Whales do not have legs at all. They don't have any sort of fins besides the tail fin here at the very back. But whales still have some bones where legs would normally connect, where their pelvis would normally be. Humans have a tiny little structure on the end of their large intestine called the appendix that doesn't really contribute a whole lot to the human body, but still is there and a lot of times has to be taken out by people when it becomes infected or inflamed. So like appendicitis is when um, people like wake up in the middle of the night and they have terrible stomach pain and it's because their appendix got inflamed. It's swollen. It's maybe infected somehow. And an appendicitis, no, an appendectomy is when they have to get the appendix taken out. So the surgeon makes a little hole and goes in and cuts out the appendix. So it's this piece of the body that we can cut out with absolutely no repercussions on our life. People that have their appendix taken out have completely normal, full, healthy lives. So it only seems like it's there to cause problems and give people a lot of pain if it gets infected. So why do we still have it? That seems kind of dumb. The reason why all of these structures still exist also has to do with evolution. They're called vestigial structures, and they are kind of evolutionary leftovers. They're things that even though the modern day organisms don't really need them, their ancestors at one point had them and they were important. And these organisms just so happen to have not been able to fully evolve away from them yet. So like ostriches, for example, are a type of bird. One of the big things everybody knows about birds is that they have wings. So because ostriches evolved from other birds, ostriches have wings, even though they don't fly. Whales are mammals. They might live in the ocean, but they breathe air and they have hair on their body. And they are, they give birth to live young who drinks milk from the mom when it's a baby. Whales are mammals just like we are, just like your dog and cat are, just like horses and sheep are. And most mammals have four limbs, right? If you think about 
like the squirrels and raccoons that might live in your yard, or you, your friends, your pets, your dog and cat, they all have four limbs. So whales and dolphins and porpoises and stuff like that used to have four limbs. When they evolved to survive and thrive in the water, they lost their back limbs because they didn't really need them anymore and they were slowing them down. But they still haven't completely gotten rid of that little pelvis bone floating around right back here. So these are vestigial structures. Structures that animals today have, not because they need them, not because they're important, but because they belonged to a common ancestor that did have them and was important for them, and we just haven't lost them in the modern species yet. So like our salamander lizard up here has these hind limbs that connect to the pelvis right here. But the boa constrictor, the snake, does not, right? All vertebrates, all higher vertebrates, meaning ones that live on land and move around, had an ancestor with four limbs. So most vertebrates still have four limbs, right? Even including things like birds and amphibians and reptiles, for the most part, they all have four limbs. And so the organisms that lost those four limbs usually still have some leftovers of those limbs behind, right? The whale still has its front two limbs, and then it has this kind of floating pelvis bone left over in the back here. The boa constrictor has completely lost the front two limbs, but it still has a little bit of a pectoral bone back here left over from its common ancestor that did have limbs. So these vestigial structures, they're not useful to the organism, but it still has them and it still develops them because it hasn't completely evolved away from them. It hasn't completely lost them through evolution yet. So like in certain snakes, you can still find on around that pelvic area, these tiny like leg bones right here that are left over from the ancient ancestor of snakes that did have legs. So here is Charles Darwin in his later years. And it's thanks to him that we have this, I, he was the first person that really put into words this idea of evolution, this idea that ancient species over time slowly evolve and slowly become the modern day species that we see today. So we can tell certain organisms are related to each other because of those comparative structures, those homologous structures that we can find that are extremely similar despite the fact that they're found in completely different organisms. So it suggests that at some point, all those organisms had a common ancestor that then over thousands and millions of generations evolved, changed, developed new traits, new characteristics, but still held on to some of those basic kind of body structure details. Some organisms still have those body structures left over even if they don't really use them anymore, like the ostrich wings or the human appendix. We had an ancestor who had one, and for that ancestor, it was important, but now we don't really need it, but we still have it around because we are descended from that ancestor who had it. All right. Does anybody have any more evolution questions, things about this idea of changing over time or shared structures, similar structures that is still a little bit confusing, you're still not sure about, you still have questions on, please feel free to fire away. <laughs> 
No, thank you, Mr. Mike. I don't have any questions. All right. So the homework assignments for today and tomorrow have to do with these kind of similar structures, have to do with the ways in which the struct what these structures can tell us about how related certain organisms are. So like for today's, for example, we have what should look like a very familiar set of limbs. So here we have some human bones, we have some whale bones, some crocodile bones right here. We've got some cat bones, some bird wings, and some bat wings. And so for a couple of these different structures, specifically the cat and the crocodile, I want you to compare the form of their arm. So how do the bones in a cat arm compare to the bones in a human arm? What is similar and what is different about them? How do the bones in a crocodile arm compare to a human arm? What is similar and what is different about them? So that's the first part of each question. That's what the form part means. How are the bones related? And then the second part, the function, I want you to tell me what do crocodiles use their arm for and how is that different or similar to human arms? What do cats use their arm for and how is that similar or different to human arms? So again, for the first part, and I have some examples that use the whale here to kind of guide you for the type of stuff I'm looking for. But again, the basic idea is for the first part of the question, you're comparing the structure, the form, how do these arms actually look similar or different to each other? And then the second part, you're comparing the function. How do these animals use their arms and how is that similar or different to human arms? So tomorrow's homework is kind of along some of these similar lines. The first part asks about this butterfly wing over here and this bird wing over here. And so I want you to tell me about what do butterflies and birds use their wing fors what is the difference between butterfly wings and bird wings? How are they different from each other? And then finally, what makes them good examples of analogous structures? So why is comparing a bird wing and a butterfly wing not a good example of homology or not a very good example of a shared ancestor? And then secondly, we have our another picture here comparing a minnow, so a very standard smallish type of fish, and a cave fish over here. And so since you guys are here in class with me, excuse me, I'll go ahead and give away one of the answers to this question. So the picture sometimes is kind of hard to tell, but I I can promise you all the parts of the cave fish that are supposed to be there are on there on this picture. So does anybody notice any major big difference between how a cave fish looks and how a minnow looks? Like the eye? Exactly. Cave fish 
this guy right here, there's there's no eye. He's missing his eyes right here. Minnows, like most fish, have eyes. So cavefish do not have eyes and minnows do. And so for the, that's kind of giving away question number four, but I'm fine with that since you guys are here joining along in class. But for number five, if minnows and cavefish descended from the same fishy ancestor that probably had eyes at some point in the past, why do you think the cavefish don't have eyes? What do you think could have happened that caused cavefish, so fish that live in caves where there's no light or very little light and they're living essentially blind in these puddles, why would they lose their eyes? Why would they not develop eyeballs? So that is what I want you to think about for that last question here for your homework tomorrow. All right, any more questions about evolution or the assignment for today with the different structures or the assignment tomorrow with the wings and the fish? No, Mr. Michael. All righty. Uh, so the last thing that I wanted to do is give you a little bit of a sneak peek into the notes that we'll be going over on Thursday. And this is mostly because Brandy was asking earlier about stuff that might be on the star test that we won't get to by tomorrow. So tomorrow we're going to be talking about cladograms, which is a type of diagram that scientists make in order to show how organisms have developed over time or to show kind of how closely related different modern organisms are. And so tomorrow we'll go super into detail on exactly how it is to read platograms. But the biggest thing to know about cladograms, and when we get to them tomorrow, is that the closer you are on the cladogram, the more related that you are. So for example, on this cladogram right here, we have things going all the way from lampreys, little eel-like things that live in the water, through sharks and lizards, up to humans. And so the closer that two organisms are to each other means that they're more closely related. So for example, a lynx is more closely related to a chimpanzee than it is to a shark because they're close together on our little tree here, on our little diagram, right? Chimpanzees are more closely related to humans than they are to lizards. So that's kind of the first major thing that we're going to be talking about tomorrow with platograms is that the closer you are, the more related you are. And then the other thing is that usually cladograms are split up by traits. So as you go further and further up the cladogram, you develop more and more and more traits. So for example, lampreys have some bones, but they don't have any jaw bones. They have kind of these weird sucker-like mouths. So all of these other organisms have jaws, right? Sharks have jaws, but they don't have any lungs, which is our next trait. All of the other organisms up here have lungs. Newts, when they make their eggs, they don't put a special membrane about it called an amniotic membrane. Everybody else does. Lizards have jaws and lungs and make an amniotic membrane, but they do not have hair. Lynx, chimpanzees, and humans have hair. Lynx have all these things in hair, but they have a tail, but chimpanzees and humans do not have a tail. So that's usually how these cladograms get divided up, is based on 
these kind of more and more and more uh, divergent and more and more derived characteristics. So like I said, we'll get a lot more into that on Thursday, but I just wanted to bring it up to you now in case you encounter it in your life before you get to it again on Thursday.